knowledge and information. This is the theme of this year's edition of Global Access. The importance of knowledge has been evident to man since the beginning of time. But the Information Society presents new questions. How does the increasingly intense flow of information affect our ability to maintain a holistic understanding of the world? And does it actually make us smarter or dumber? According to Father Antoni Yusselo, a Jesuit priest and Associate Professor of East Asian Studies, the first global information network was developed by the Jesuits. In this conversation with Thomas Geer, Yusselo explains how it came about in the 16th century. The European expansion was also an expansion of knowledge through networks and uh, one of the most important that was created during the 16th century was actually by the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. How come that they um, initiated such a global knowledge network and expansion as they did? I think that they didn't initially plan it that way. Um, <clears throat> when Ignatius of Loyola, the founder, and his first companions, about 10 of them, um, decided uh, that they would um, somehow put themselves at the service of the Roman Catholic Church, their first idea was to go to Jerusalem and to engage in missionary work there. Since that didn't work, they then went to Rome and they put themselves at the service of the Pope. And of course, we're at the beginning of the uh, Counter-Reformation. So quite quickly, they ended up also being involved in a certain movement um, of reform from within the Catholic Church and also in opposition in part to Luther and later Calvin. So while this was going on in Europe, then the opportunity came up to go to new worlds. And of course, this happened thanks to the division of the world, basically like an orange into two uh, by Pope Alexander VI the Borgia, who uh, allowed the Portuguese and the Spanish to explore both the East and the West. So um, uh, there was this line beyond um, a certain island in the Atlantic, and everything to the west of that line was to be explored by Spain, and everything to the east by the Portuguese. And so the um, Society of Jesus decided, well, we have to be on those ships. We have to explore new areas. And that's how they first went to Latin America and to Asia. Was that uh, by, uh, by Christian missionary zeal or was it in general terms of knowledge? Or what, what it was, was a missionary purpose, yeah. yes. So with uh, the idea of uh, new places to explore came the idea that these are new opportunities uh, for missionary work. And of course it had to be uh, under the patronage of the Spanish and the Portuguese crowns. Now for East Asia, which is the area that I know best, it was a very long, tedious and dangerous route that took two and a half years to travel from Lisbon down the coast of Africa uh, to Mozambique, where they would winter. From there, they would make the crossing uh, to Goa. And then again, they would wait for the monsoons to change. They would then again sail down the coast of India to the eastern part. From there, through the Straits of Malacca, where the Portuguese, of course, had a very strategic fort, which you can still visit today. And the Straits of Malacca was, to this day, uh, a strategic place because it controls access to the South China Sea. Mm. One, one wonders uh, what were their frame of thought, or shall we say it in German, their well done showing in a way of, yes. of, of, of uh, going through all this uh, enormous labor of, of, of uh, travel and, and uh, preparations and so forth and, and communications lines that were very faulty, I guess, at that time. Well, there was certainly this aspect of religious zeal. Mm. But once they arrived, uh, again, through the streets of Malacca up to Macau, 
Um, and from Macau on the southern coast of China, they made their way all the way to Nagasaki in Japan. Japan was only known through the writings of Marco Polo until the Portuguese, in a storm, uh, accidentally reached southern Japan in um, 1543. And very soon thereafter, only six years thereafter, the Jesuits started a mission in Japan. But there must have been some kind of universalism, both in search of knowledge, yes. but also in search of, I mean, from a religious point of view, of, of, of that these people were, uh, you could convert them to, to Christianity, or you could have, at least have a dialogue with them on, on, on similar issues of morality and transcendence and so forth. Well, that's interesting because um, Japan remained, for example, taking that uh, country as an example, a semi-mythical place. But when they arrived, the first missionary, Francis Xavier, was shocked because the, the idea of mission had been dominated by um, experience with Indians uh, in Goa and in the areas along the fishery coast where people were very poor and illiterate. The same with the people they met uh, in Malaya. And of course, they already had reports from Latin America. And suddenly in Japan, they meet people um, who from their standpoint were highly educated and had um, a very complex writing system, which of course they took from China. And in one of his first letters in November of 1549, a few months after his arrival, Francis Xavier, who's a master of the University of Paris, writes back to Europe and he says, they have universities here. Mm -hmm. And I am going to go and debate with them in these universities. So for the Europeans, the discovery and experience and encounter with East Asia was in many ways a positive shock. I guess sometimes, especially in more uh, sort of critical studies in, 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 in Western academia, uh, uh, these people, Jesuits, missionaries of all kinds, uh, different kinds, are, are explorers, are, are described very much as precursors of colonialism. Or, or, or yes. uh, Did they have such an idea of, of also being uh, contributing to creating empire, the empires of, of, of the Portuguese Empire, the Spanish Empire? I have to admit, uh, this is a complex question because the group of missionaries that went <clears throat> to Asia came from different countries. Though from the very beginning, they were an international group. Even, they were, even though they were under the patronage of Portugal, on those ships, you also had Jesuit missionaries from Spain, uh, from Italy, um, and from a number of other countries as well. So certainly uh, the missionaries as a group did not have this idea of conquest or being part of this. There were some Spaniards, there were some Portuguese who may have thought that this could be possibly um, a way to think about future conquest, but soon they discovered as they write in their descriptions, the warlike samurai of Japan and the nature of this country would make it absolutely impossible, in fact, unthinkable for Europe to even attempt such a thing at a secular level. And so we have to engage with them in some sort of meaningful dialogue. And then there was an enormous transfer of knowledge back to Europe from all these yes. missionaries. They. I think they wrote continuously, they wrote reports and letters and, and, uh, yes. and everything amassed in a way in, in Rome. Yes, it did. Uh, it wasn't only Rome, but certainly Rome was the first uh, destination of these letters. And it had to do with a very complex system of correspondence that the Jesuits created in order to maintain some sort of unity because it was a small group that was dispersed all over the world. And so they were instructed to write back at least once a year, and so they did. And there were personal letters uh, and correspondence. There were reports, the f beginnings of ethnographic treatises, maps, drawings um, of the people. Um, and these reports and correspondence were often sent on more than one ship 
They were redundancy in a way. I think they would exactly. wrote three reports at a time in order. If That's you right. Them. Yes. So they would they would often um, write uh, more than one report in the hope that at least one of the three ships would not sink. And so if you look uh, at the collections in the Roman archives, you see that sometimes you have it, um, you have one uh, letter that has survived, uh, two letters or all three. And on the letters it says uh, in Spanish or in Portuguese, primera via, segunda via, tercera via. Um, and if we have only the tercera via, the third uh, copy, then we know that the first two were lost. Mm. What was behind this thirst of knowledge, in a way? I mean, I mean, other other nations sent emissaries to 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 Europe, for example, so in order to gather information. But this um, 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 massive collection, systematic massive collection of knowledge, in that sense, is it? What was the what was the reason behind it? Well, that is a, a curious question. Um, certainly, the zeal for conversion and bringing the Christian faith to Asia is one motivation. But um, on the other hand, I think there is that indomitable human spirit of curiosity. And um, as they learn the languages, Japanese and Chinese. Uh, and they realized that these are ancient civilizations. One of their first uh, interesting comments in these letters is, we have discovered a new ancient Rome and ancient Greece, ancient Japan and ancient China. And just like uh, Roman culture in some way was heavily influenced by an older culture, which was ancient Greece. So to Japan, with its ancient civilization, takes its writing system and much of its culture from ancient China. And so they said, this is a new ancient civilization. Mm -hmm. And so just like Christianity started um, in Rome and in Greece, and um, you had the first missionaries, you can call them, in inverted commas, who went to Athens and uh, later on, of course, to Rome. They said, well, we can do the same thing here. We can engage the way we did with pagan Greece and pagan Rome with uh, China and with Japan. Uh, there was, I guess, an enormous amount of knowledge transfer, uh, and it more or less also worked both ways, but did Europe, did the Europeans consider that they learned anything from these civilizations, or was it just a report on customs, uh, botanical um, uh, descriptions of, of herbs and so forth, or what, or what did, 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 they, did they learn anything from technological point of view and a philosophical, political, moral point of view? Did they consider that they were learning anything? This took time, mm. and it was a process. And the process developed uh, as a result of, well, first of all, learning the language. Because obviously with Japan and China, the language barrier is so high that if you don't know the language, you don't know the culture. And if you don't know the language, you cannot read uh, the, either the Buddhist literature or the secular literature or the histories. And as they learn these languages, we also see a process of changing their opinions. So when I said, well, they thought that Japan and China was like ancient Greece and ancient Rome, in a way that's sort of at the end of the process where they have now realized this because they have acquired uh, the languages that were necessary. And you see, even within the same writer, and I'm going to quote Alessandro Valignano, an Italian, who was in charge of this mission, both in Japan and China, he, um, criticized Japan, saying, well, they have these barbaric customs. For example, in, in villages where there's poverty, sometimes the parents will drown the small children because they can't feed them. So this is barbaric, this is unchristian. This is, this is a great culture, but this is something where they have to change. In later years, when he wrote back to Rome, 20, 30 years later, he said, I still think this is a bad thing. But the only reason they do it is out of poverty and desperation. Actually, they're very ethical. They don't want these children who will have no future to suffer. 
In China, as they got to learn about Confucianism, they had tremendously high respect for Chinese philosophy. And in fact, it became one of the main media through which they dialogued with China. Mm. But there was also a flow of knowledge both ways from Europe to the um, to East Asia to Latin America through the through the Jesuits. Yes, um, <clears throat> many of them had studied at the main college that the Jesuits founded in Rome, the Collegio Romano. And there you had uh, famous scientific figures like uh, Clavius, who was a great uh, mathematician, and he was in fact an interlocutor and uh, you could say partner of debate with Galileo. And so many of them, including for example Matteo Ricci, who went to China, and <clears throat> others studied under Clavius, so they had this knowledge. And when they came to China, uh, they ended up at the service of the emperor. And in fact, two Jesuits built an imperial observatory for the emperor. And why did they do that? Because the calendar and the ability to predict a f natural phenomena was linked to the idea that the emperor is legitimate. Mm. And if you don't properly predict natural phenomena, for example, like lunar eclipses, it means the emperor might be losing his legitimacy and his mandate of heaven, as they called it in China. And there were uh, astronomers uh, following Chinese traditions, also following Islamic traditions, and they were not able to predict certain eclipses. And when the Jesuits did that, the emperor was convinced that we need to introduce this new technology for the good of the Chinese empire. Mm. And that's an example of um, transfer of knowledge. And they were ready to give away that technology as well, or technological knowledge. Yes, they were. And uh, they thought that um, science would also be a way to dialogue about ideas and morality and philosophy and eventually religious issues. Mm. So it was a question of not here I am, this is my religion, now you should convert to it, but I have something that I believe is very valuable and very precious, which is my faith, but in order for us to talk about that, first let me tell you who I am. Hmm. What are my uh, ethical values? What's my morality? Ricci, for example, translated a very famous book in 1595, a hundred ancient Roman and Greek maxims on friendship. And this book on friendship became among the Mandarin scholars of the 16th and early 17th century a bestseller. And it allowed Ricci to contact many Chinese scholars at the highest level because he was considered this master from the West. He had something to say. Otherwise, the Chinese thought of all foreigners as barbarians. Mm. But the, the transfer of knowledge was not just the question of translating things and just giving them away, but it was also, I guess, a kind of a cooperation between uh, Western Jesuit scholars and, and, and Eastern scholars, uh, as in, in East Asia? Well, certainly the Imperial Observatory in uh, Beijing is an example, in fact, of collaboration between uh, scholars who are both from the West and from the East. One example, again, with Ricci is the translation of Euclid's geometry. Now, interestingly... Um, to Japanese, I think, or is it... Japanese? It's also into Chinese. Okay. Yes. Um, Clavius wrote one of the most popular textbooks of Euclidean geometry that was used in European colleges uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries, well, for decades. It was printed in 1574. And so he had studied this, and he brought it with him to uh, China, and together with Xu Guangqi, who was a great Mandarin scholar and a very practical man, they together translated Euclidean geometry. And in fact, in the preface, it says, Master Li, that was his name in Chinese, Li Ma Do, Master Li dictated uh, the translation that he was offering of uh, the Euclidean text, and Master Xu, the Chinese scholar, wrote it down. 
and obviously polished it up into uh, proper classical Chinese. Mm. So that's a really interesting example of um, working together. Matteo Ricci also brought Abraham Ortelius's famous uh, atlas uh, of 1570 uh, in a later edition, probably from the 1580s and 90s. It was reprinted in Europe many times. And working together with Chinese scholars, he created a new world map using Gerhard Mercator's projection, but putting the Pacific Ocean at the center instead of the Atlantic. That's how we get the word Far East mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in English, because if the Atlantic is at the center, Asia's at the Far East, but that wouldn't work in China, no, which is the Middle, the Middle Kingdom. kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot have the Middle Kingdom at the, at the far edge of the map. No, precisely. And many, many names of countries that Ricci and Li Zhizhou, another scholar, uh, together invented in Chinese are still used today. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we briefly mentioned them, but let's develop on them a bit more. The two technological innovations that were fairly important. Uh, pr the printing press, obviously, because we yes. spoke about books and spreading of knowledge, and cartography, uh, which is a part of, yeah. I mean, uh, both understanding geography, projections, but also astronomy and, and, and uh, so forth. And these were also, I think, I understand as these two technological innovations or developments were also crucial for the ability of the Jesuits to, to, to uphold this very large informational network. Yes. Um, and it was uh, a means that was important in both directions. Oh. Mm. So certainly, uh, you know, today we use the Internet and we talk about Google and Facebook and all these different ways of instant communication. Well, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of the Gutenberg press because going from uh, medieval monasteries with limited numbers of manuscripts uh, made into large books that often in libraries like Oxford, for example, are chained to uh, desks so that they're not taken away. They were so valuable and very few people had access to them. The Gutenberg Press suddenly made it possible for Europeans to have information about everything mm. and at low cost. And so when all these, all these reports were coming back from Asia or from Latin America, they were soon printed and distributed in thousands of copies in different languages. And uh, for Japan, for example, they brought a Gutenberg press in 1590 to Japan. And in fact, they were in, the Jesuits were involved in the casting of the first metal type of Japanese. What's interesting is that who invented metal type? Not Gutenberg, the Koreans in the 13th century. And then it really developed in the 14th and 15th centuries. And 1590 is the year, ironically, that metal type comes into Japan through the missionaries and the Gutenberg press and through the Koreans at the same time. In China, it was not necessary because woodblock printing was so developed mm. and there was such a network of bookshops, like in Europe, that uh, the missionaries decided to simply use the local print shops. And why were they so developed? Because in order to get a position in the Chinese government, you had to take the first provincial and then imperial examination. And in order to do this, you needed textbooks. And so you would go to a local bookshop and they would print the necessary texts. What were the long-term effects of this uh, global network maintained by an elite of scholars, but fairly few people. How many people are we talking about? It's, it's like it's really only a couple of hundred. Hundreds, yes. Yeah, that's that's but all they it have, is. But they have left an enormous amount of material among them. And I think I also yes. saw, I think I saw in some of one of your materials that uh, they were also getting correspondence back. That 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 I think Nazis Loyola himself answered like eight thousand letters. So there was a huge yes, he yeah. wrote eight thousand letters. <laughs> um, the the problem is that. Unfortunately, a lot of the correspondence that went from Europe back to Asia has been lost. Not, really. Not all of it, some mm. of it uh, exists, but in Japan, for example, once Japan decided to close uh, her doors to foreigners except for the Dutch and to a limited number of Chinese merchants, 
in 1639 and a persecution of Christianity broke out, they systematically destroyed all these materials. In China, many, very often they were dispersed. Mm. Some of these materials, however, were sent uh, to Macau and that archive was later sent to Lisbon. So thanks to that, and thanks to some archives in Manila then being sent back to the authorities in Madrid, we have some material. Mm. But we have mainly the correspondence that came from Asia uh, to Europe. In, in conclusion, just going back before we started about the letters, uh, <laughs> What are the long-term effects of it, and, are, and, and do we have any elements of it uh, uh, that are well, implications for, for, for today from this global, the first global knowledge network that was created? Am I allowed to be controversial on Swedish television? <laughs> um, two or three days ago, uh, I was reading with some dismay how... Um, Mr. Trump uh, decided that now uh, Chinese graduate students in STEM subjects, so in scientific subjects, will only be given a visa for one year in the United States, which is where I work. And I thought, how strange, because uh, here we are, we think of ourselves always as better uh, in the 20th or 21st centuries, and in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, with all the difficulties, with all the imperfections, there was a desire to communicate knowledge. And now, in different parts of the world, sometimes we talk about how we can limit that transfer of knowledge. Of course, copyright is very important. Of course, uh, trade secrets are very important. But still, uh, Somehow, when you talk about limiting the capacity of students, and I'm a teacher, uh, to receive knowledge, um, and here we're talking about the West and China. So I feel that that is sad because uh, we must find more creative ways to continue this dialogue. And I hope that this will be a contribution to that of, of dispersing more knowledge. So thank you very much, Dr. Yusuf. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.